Okay, so we can start. That never happened. It was so quiet before. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> well, I, just, I want to welcome you at 17th edition of UIUX. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, today we're having two speakers, well, three of them. Pascal from Musitz and Gloria and Matthias from Zalanda. Thank you also, M26, for being a great host, having us here, providing venue, foods, and drinks. Just so you know, this is a schedule, what we are expecting today. Basically, first it will be Pascal at, uh, well, soon five minutes. Then short break, Gloria and Matthias, and then at the end, as usual, community minute, uh, where you can share your thoughts, if you have anything to share with the community. Also, job opportunities are uh, welcome to share here. And I also have some other information. Basically, if you're looking for Wi-Fi, here is one side and there at the wall, so you can like use uh, N26 Wi-Fi. Also, toilets uh, are there, that was cool, just so you know. The first thing that I want to share is like this meetup works as a community meetup. We get feedback from you, we ask what kind of topics you want to hear, what kind of speakers, if anyone wants to be a speaker from your side, if you have a venue that wants to post this meetup, we're always happy to have your feedback. I'm also sending you these emails where you can also answer the survey and help us to see through the content of the meetup. Uh, also, if you want to have some of them print out, you can also do it here physically already. But I wanted to share also some fun facts about this meetup. This is like 17th edition. We started with meetup in Shanghai in 2015. We brought it in May 2017 to Berlin. And now this meetup is the largest UI UX community, meetup community in Germany, and also in top three communities in Europe. So thank you very much for attending this meetup. <laughs> It also gives us a platform to join new designers with uh, more experienced ones. I didn't want to say old ones. <laughs> Basically, the idea is to learn new stuff, to share your experiences, and this, to grow your network as much as you can. My name is Tiana. I'm working for Wirecraft. This is a digital agency. We're based in Shanghai and Berlin. And basically, we're specialized in data science, office, and DevOps. Uh, next to it, we're also organizing tech events and helping companies also to increase their audience and many more stuff. If you want to find out more, you can always approach me. I can I'd be happy to share it with you. Also, my coworkers are here, Quentin and Paul. Yeah. Uh, and also, you know, the digital world, you can always check our webpage. It's, so if you're going to use social media, uh, you can use this hashtag, like mm -hmm. my UX, so we have it all compact to see what are your thoughts on this meetup. The first speaker will be telling you a story. His name is Pascal and he works for UCITS. And after Q&A round and short break, we'll be hearing uh, design maturity, how to raise the bar, like insights from Zalando, Presented by Gloria and Matthias. And now I would like to welcome Florian from N26 to welcome you here at the venue. Thank you. We actually want to welcome you, so good evening. We're really, really excited to see a full house. It's always an honor to, uh, to have the Design UI UX meetup in our uh, office because we started doing this quite early when the, uh, when the meetup was quite new. And it's always nice to see like how this evolves and this event series has been also really nice for us because we're connecting with a lot of people. So you're obviously um, in the offices of N26, we are the mobile bank. We are trying to build a bank that the world actually loves to use. So this is a quite huge challenge and very, very exciting. We are obviously also extending our design team continuously. So. Um, every month we get a lot of applications and like we put a lot of focus on the hiring process to get the right people in. So if you uh, look on the website and you think you might be a fit, you can also just talk to us today. So there's a few people walking around, usually these people who have low tags and are eating a lot of pizza. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we, have, we are around 
if you want to ask us questions, uh, we are here all evening, and we are really excited to see the talks of uh, new seats in Zola. Thank you. There we go. Hello, everyone. It's good to see you all. So, with that, let's just get going. Well, so why did I just show you these pictures? That may be a weird intro. That's because they're personal to me, of course, but they tell you a story, um, one that we lived through this summer. So we went to Hong Kong after years of waiting for it. And we were so excited and finally got there after 18 hours of flight and we're happy to still be alive. <laughs> and eventually we were hit by a, like on the second day by a tropic thunderstorm and rainstorm that lasted for almost the entire two weeks we stayed there, so it was horrible. <laughs> we tried to make the best out of it, but it was tough, I tell you. But in the end, by like a crazy coincidence, we managed to turn it around, to have an amazing experience, and to actually make some cool new friends. And so this story has something to it. It's got this highs, it's got its lows, and there's like a lot of typical elements, but it may be hard to follow in the way I presented it to you right now. It may not be the best way to show all this. So with it, let me tell you a story about stories and storytelling. Why? Because it's super fun <laughs> and because it's really important. And what do I mean by that? Stories make for the best nights out. Look at how much fun you're having up there with your friend telling this amazing thing that just happened to them last night and you're laughing so hard and you're going on and having a crazy adventure this night that you're going to tell for the next few months over and over again and that makes for a great conversation starter. I think you all know what I'm talking about. That's why we go out, that's why we meet friends, that's why it actually is fun. They make us spend our dollars. Look at how shocked he is. <laughs> Whole industries, Hollywood, books, authors, everything, all the stars that we, we admire so much are built on telling stories and telling them well. It's something that's really deep entrenched in our culture and that's so hard to get out right now that you shouldn't even want to. They make you sell your designs, and that's probably what you're here for today. Even artists get to eat, it's totally fine from the judging. <laughs> and giving all that context, like everything you saw before, that it's, it's so important. That's the same way why you spend it, that's the same reason others spend it. And including a story, just seeing these guys in a concert gives all this image complete new meaning and, and gives completely new weight to it. Last but not least, stories are what keep our whole world together. And that may sound super vague and super weird, but all this wouldn't be possible without stories. But I'm gonna get to that in a second. Who am I and why am I even talking to you about this? So my name is Pascal, I think you already got that. I'm a UX designer at digital agency UCs. Um, I get a rather diverse background, so learn some design, but 
did a lot of research, studied psychology, I got a degree in engineering, and all this sets me up for product design really well. But what I didn't learn at all is being an author, is writing, is journalism, is telling stories. So probably neither did you. Um, so I'm not set out any differently from you for this. But for me, design is communication above anything else, no matter what you design, it's always the same thing. It's about getting your ideas and your thoughts across to the other person and doing that in a meaningful way. And storytelling is what you help, helps you do that. And I tried, had to come a long way to get there actually to really understand it and even now it's super hard for me. And I still tend to forget it every now and then, but reminding myself of the principles of the storytelling and with how you can engage your audience really helps me in every step of the design process. And that's what I, sh what I want to share with you today, so you can utilize the same principles as I do. Okay, but let's back up and do what are we talking about today? Stories. Stories are a way, simply put, for two people to create a shared understanding of a subject. And the subject can be real, we can explain you what this table looks like, but it can also be fiction, and so it can be a concept in your head that can get across to you. And everyone knows all about this and why this is important. It's because this is stuff you do every day. It's explaining concepts to clients or how your product may affect the world. So let me explain why stories are so important for us as a culture. And I'm going to take uh, an example from a book by Yuval Noah Harari, it's called Sapiens. Let's start with gossip. <laughs> Actually not that gossip, forget that. That gossip. That's two people talking to each other. They're talking about this coworker they have in their office, and maybe how great he is. Story gossip doesn't have to be negative. You have like the sound of negativity to it. But it's just talking about a different person that's not here. And that's actually the reason why we were able to form bonds that are bigger than what other animals can do. And collaborating in a big group is what sets people apart and what actually always means which of the animals is going to be surviving in the craziest case. So, chimpanzees, let's say, can form bonds of groups of people, of chimpanzees, <laughs> <laughs> obviously, of up to 20 to 25 individuals, and that's because they have to know everyone in the group really intimately and have to share a relationship, to know their status, to know how to rank them and how to interact with them and what their goals are and to actually share a common goal. And they do this by spending a lot of time and 25 people or individuals, that's a lot of time, we've got to get time for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's why they can't grow bonds or groups that are bigger because humans manage to. And that's because of gossip, because gossip enables you to get a shared understanding of many more individuals in the group. So by talking about someone that I don't really actually spend that much time with, I can know what their status is, how they relate to others, what they're trying to do, what they want to do, what their fears and wishes are. And that's what enables us to create groups and bonds of up to 150 individuals and enable people to actually sort of rise above the animals and, and make the world their own. And this number, 150 individuals, is called the Dunbar's number that's coined by Robin Dunbar and he loosely describes it as the number of people that you wouldn't feel ashamed or weird joining for a drink uninvitedly if you just met them. Okay, but 150 people, that's not our whole world, there's got to be more to it. And that's example number two, common myths. So, what do we have in common with this monkey? We all have the same understanding of this banana. It's material, we can, we can see, we can touch it, we know what it's worth. But 
what differentiates us from this monkey is this ability we have to believe in fiction as ideas and take them for real. It sounds really great, but people are living in a dual reality. So we have the real reality, the physical reality of cars and streets and dogs and trees and monkeys and bananas. But we have the fiction of reality of concepts that we believe in so much we actually think they're real. And this includes gods, it includes nations, it includes contracts, it includes companies, and it includes money. Let me go with money as an example. Money may seem real to you, you can touch it, it's a bill, it's a coin, but the coin and the bill doesn't have anything to do really with money. Money can be anything, it has been anything throughout history. Um, people used seashells, or salt, or cigarettes as money. It's whatever you can assign a certain value to and whatever helps you compare the value of goods and exchange goods for it. 90% of our money we use every day doesn't even exist. It's an entry in the database that has no physical representation. Yet, you would be totally happy trading this entry in a database for a good that you give someone else. But it doesn't make any real sense. It's just a concept and the shared belief you have in it. That you think that others are going to value it as well, just as much as you do it. And this sort of collaboration allowed us to collectively believe these concepts and to grow bonds as they, as spanning the whole world right now. Okay, storytelling. Storytelling is simply put the act of translating a story in an effective, engaging, interesting way, the way you can actually keep it, memorize it, and take something away from it, and just listen to what I'm even saying, and actually hear the words I'm saying, and not just forget it the minute I walk out. And what it means to, to tell a story in our context, I want to share an example with you that I got from Andrea Moritz Lar from Omada Health. Omada Health is a, just a startup right now, it's focused on health, and their goal is to basically educate a way of living that includes healthy eating and exercise to prevent diseases that didn't need to exist. So, kind of a noble goal. And she would go into a presentation and say, okay, let's, let's put it straight, 86 million Americans are going to be diagnosed with type 2 diabetes in the next year. And you would be like, you wouldn't even listen to her. So what it's that she does is she goes in a room and says, okay, there's five people in this room right now, and three of us are going to die from a disease that we gave ourselves. And now all of a sudden you get their attention because it addresses them personally and you think about, I did it myself, it's weird, I shouldn't do that. Um, so you can actually achieve a noble mission and a good message by starting out with a shocking idea. Okay, where can you apply stories and storytelling in your everyday work? So, I separated it and looked at it, how you can apply this in product design and product development. And one thing you can do is you can use it to communicate and define. This, looks, this section looks at everything that's happening in the space behind the scenes while you're working on the product, while you're developing your ideas. Obviously presentations, like, sure, who wouldn't have thought of that? <laughs> Just remember the uh, example I just showed you with the health framing, and that should give you a good idea of what I mean. But that's not all. Personas and journeys. Show of hands, who of you use personas and journeys in your day to day work? There's quite a few. Who of them use ones that are actually believable and not just like made up really weirdly? 
Yeah, not that many anymore. <laughs> but okay, personas and journeys are a great idea of, or a great way to incorporate storytelling in your day to day work. And all of you probably know that. But it's setting up a character that's understandable and believable, that has emotions and has a motivation and a goal they want to achieve. And then it takes them along the journey, has an ups and downs, he's happy, he's sad, and eventually he reaches, hopefully, a happy end. But from the, these journeys, he, he can carry that on. Storyboarding, everyone knows storyboarding. I'm not telling you anything new. But probably you don't use it because it seems so hard or you don't see the value. And that's just a plain mistake because it's actually really easy to sketch out your storyboard really quickly and it helps you throughout the entire design process from start to finish. It's not a relic you develop at the beginning and then pull away. It's a way to show what I just showed you in this journey, but visually engaging in a way that you can look at it and can understand it really quickly without reading tons of text because they have this expression, emotion they show you. And you can use that throughout your design process and iterations to always put everyone back in the same bowl on the table and frame the problem correctly. Starting a feedback session, just showing the storyboard one more time and everyone knows what we're talking about and how you can actually give constructive feedback instead of just pointing and saying, I don't like this color. Yeah, you all know so well. Taking this idea of storyboarding further, you can incorporate the same principles and ideas into your screen designs. And that just goes to show, don't start with full screen designs of huge, maybe widescreen images with tons of information that you don't need. It's going to be distracting, it's going to be out of context, and it's going to be hard to relate it all into what actually matters. So by starting out in a story-based way, just only sketching out the part the user focuses on, the stuff they read, the things they click on, the messages they see as a response, you can go through this journey they need to take and they will eventually bring them to succeeding at their goal to have a positive outcome for them and to just see every bit of the the, the way, the journey they take there. And this makes it easy for your team to spot problems or errors or stuff that doesn't make sense because you know exactly which parts they see, what the information is they have going into the next step. And just presenting on fine screen, you're always missing that. And you can take this concept from really low press and low fidelity, like you see here, and take it all the way to doing really pretty designs and still keep the process of the story. Okay, so that's an everything behind the scenes. Now let's look at how you could look at it a different way, how you can incorporate storytelling into your actual finished product. And there's two things you can do with it. You can educate or entertain. Education. User onboarding is a great example of that. Of course, there's tons more. But just imagine people are downloading your app from the App Store and by the time they downloaded it, they already forgot what it's for and God knows how to use it. You may think it's easy, but sure, it's not it never is. And so you can introduce the features you want them to use in a way that you or your technicians may understand. So you could say, public class personalization, account aggregation, and offline storage, and everyone who's reading this is just plain uninterested or bored and just probably doesn't have an interest in using that anymore because they already forgot what it's for. But this gives you the, the, the canvas to actually do something valuable and great and combine images, in this case illustrations, with the message of how it actually affects your users' lives, so speak to them and show them what it brings to them. So you can say, planning your trip is super stretch for you, look how relaxed the guy is, he's just laying there, do you want to be that guy? Or you can go over the top and do something ridiculous, like the guy right here. 
it's of course a realistic, but it's kind of fun, it makes you smile, and you totally get the message because it's so over the top. So, use storytelling to educate your users. But of course, you can use it to entertain. Everyone loves entertainment. Entertainment's great, I showed you before. And you can make a product about it. Tons of successful products use stories as the main focus of their existence. <clears throat> and if you're doing that, there's two things you can do. You can either look at how you can frame and present your content in a way that's different, that's more ma meaningful or more relevant, present better content than, than your competitors, or simply create new ways to show content or create, use different medium. So, you have Netflix doing video, you have playing books, doing books of course, and public tasks doing audio. So it doesn't matter what kind of medium you show, you can tell engaging stories and present them in any medium. Lastly, you can use storytelling to empower your users. And that sounds like a bit much, but what does it mean? It means giving your users a voice and actually enable them to share their own stories and to tell what they want to tell. Let me give you a few examples. Things before, it doesn't matter what kind of medium you use. There's tons of good examples out there. YouTube does video, medium does long form text, anchor does audio. It's a way to democratize the medium you're giving your users and making it so easy to share their stories to express themselves what otherwise would have been a big hurdle to overcome. And actually, empowers the users to speak up. And that's what makes all these platforms and all, all these, this content so much more interesting because it doesn't come just from big production firm or big money. It comes from all of us. Lastly, an example you probably all know, stories. These are the little slideshows that you can see in almost any app now. It started with Snapchat and went on to Instagram and now it's in Facebook and WhatsApp and probably any app you open in the next month or so. And what they're doing is reproducible. That doesn't mean copying the exact format, but what they're actually doing is creating a new format to tell their stories. And that's what's so engaging. It's the combination of giving you tools like the painting on the pictures and combining video and audio and images, but also setting strict limitations. So there's a time duration it can take, there's this forward mechanism, there's these limitations of users that are going to see your story interact with it, and the fact that it's going to be disappearing in 24 hours, and all these limitations engage creativity. <clears throat> That's like, because <clears throat> whenever you set someone up with specific limitations, you just keep firing away. And you can utilize this concept by enabling your users to create engaging stories by giving them specific limitations that make for an exciting format. Okay. But I'm not going to leave you high and dry with that now that you know where you can actually engage in, in storytelling and use that in your product. So to finish up, I'm going to give you four quick tips of how you can use it in your day-to-day -day work. Always talk to people. No one, when they enter a business or work, just put on their, uh, leaves their, their personality behind. You always talk to their emotions their um, fears and, and what moves them. And so whenever you address, know who your audience is and who to speak to. Make it relatable. As I showed you before, put your audience in the story, that's one way to do it, or frame your story in a way that sets it up as a character that you can follow and actually can understand. Find a structure, because telling a story that's super confusing will actually leave you remembering nothing, even if what you're telling is worth. 
So figure out a structure that's logical, and that can be totally up to you in whatever content you create or share, or you can use one that's pretty common and that's used a lot. So one example is Pixar. They follow a straight structure every time, and it's sim as simple as showing a status quo and something that disrupts the status quo, then a person, or in our case, maybe a company that comes in and solves this problem that's arise, arisen and actually brings resolution to arrive at a new status quo. And lastly, cut down on what you're saying, make your message clear and concise, edit, edit, edit. You know it's always toughest to make uh, your message really clear and not to ramble on for so long. And that's exactly the advice I'm going to take right now. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll go tell your stories. Thank you, Pascal. We're doing Q&A rounds. First question. Is there any question? Yeah? I have one. Of course. So, when we are telling stories, how do we target the audience with the disabilities? This is one of the major concerns I have because I'm in the UI development, but this is not something only to the UI developer or the UX designer. How do we fill it? Because this is also one of the topics I would like to hear. That's a good question. But, so specifically, obviously, I don't know any details about this target group, but it doesn't matter for tackling the problem because always when you're like entering a new space or when you're doing the project you don't really know about the lives of your target group so what in this case you should do is figure out how they live what their problems are what moves them what engages them and how you can affect their lives positively and how the product you're building actually will improve their lives and then use that in a way to tell an engaging story of why they benefit from your product. Does this help you in any way? Or yeah. Second question. Um, in a classical story, there's like the star and the end, right? And like there is some some kind of relevance for long parts and you kind of score long end or something like that. So how does it apply to the story where all of the data so you have to tell what all the facts are still to communicate, you can't really have a traditional story and Well, that's the part I said about finding a structure and there is this classical narrative part that starts really slow and then moves up and then meets the, the tipping point and then like, has a, a brief end. But that's not the only uh, narrative art you can use. So oftentimes, like you see in, in uh, crime shows, you have this huge peak at the beginning, oh my god, something super shocking is happening. And this is just an example that there's tons of narrative arcs that can work and they have to work depending on the content you're, you're presenting. Um, the classical one you should put just um, works really well, but it also works well for the content it's designed for. And so find the structure that brings across your message. To <laughs> So one of the one of the good points of telling a story is not to lose your audience somewhere. So, uh, but my view in the digital world, there's a beautiful thing of like the, the story changed with the technology, with whatever whatever is trending. So how would you blend in from one from one event to another, or how would you if you start with a story, for instance, and sometimes there is. Looks like stupid if you are going to go in the same way while uh, while it's like it's being like not trendy or like you are going to lose your your users or your audience this way. How would you make the shift like to go to uh, to go to another story or blend in something? Do you have an example for that? Uh, I'm sorry. Well, I mean for. For instance, I, I can give you a positive, a positive example of this. 
was also introduced here in the slide which is called Instagram. And Instagram started by you see that only adding your, your images with this is not is not getting better than you want. But they started to think about the same way like Snapchat and then they started to blend in this this way. But this is not applicable in every in, in every product. Some products go this way, some other way. Exactly. So Instagram in a way you can say the photos they share uh, tell a story, but, but one photo isn't really telling a cohesive story. So they incorporated storytelling through this feature and tweaked the feature they sort of stole from Snapchat to make it their own and, and make it do work for their audience. I think it's tough to say that every product or every feature you do is always Part of the story, like users come in and out, and they don't perceive it obvious necessarily that way. It's it's for you to uh, manage to grab your users' attention if they enter your product, and then maybe use storytelling to direct them to the new feature you want to present or want to bring out. And even if you maybe didn't do it so well before, if you get them in now and can show in what this new feature brings a benefit to their life or how it interests them or affects them in any emotional way whatsoever, then this is your way to engage in storytelling for that, I would say. I just have an add-on to that. Yeah. I think for a product and also for the story that you tell, you can shift a lot around as long as you can't interfere with your overall vision that you communicate. So you can't say you want to come the biggest thing in the world that you actually used to love and then oh actually oh, we are going to track from a mobile app to a uh, like physical bank or return on that will completely change your vision. And I think as long as your vision stays overall like consistent, um, new features and products which are consistent with your vision which you stay up and front, you can shift a lot around the story. I get the point right. Uh, storytelling mostly depends on the audience. Yeah. That means uh, if you have to tell a story, for example, for a chief or a head of, you maybe have to formulate a short story for users to be longer, am I right? Exactly. So the duration, of course, depends on who you're presenting to. You. But in the example you showed, you shouldn't say, if possible, I'm presenting it to the chief or the title whatsoever because then you're thinking in this business world again. And that brings you on a slippery slope of presenting boring uh, spreadsheets or whatever. It, it doesn't really engage them. Think about more what their personal uh, role in the company is and what they're maybe going through, what their personal motivation from this project that you're pitching them or showing them maybe, and not as much from what it brings to the company overall. So this comes second, this frame it for the person specifically because if you engage them, they're gonna advocate for you and gonna carry your message out to the company for you. You mentioned earlier that you came to UX like through research. Um, and so I was kind of interested in like how storytelling informs your strategy for research and also like how you communicate your findings back to like the editorial team? That's a good question. Um, there's obvious applications for starters when you set out to test a product, a concept, whatever you want to uh, research on or even before that, so depending on the stage you do research for, starting at the very broadest getting information for a product, you're trying to see what the story is they're living through. And that kind of um, leaves you with developing something of a customer journey based on the one you're looking at. It doesn't need to involve a product right now, but it shows you what is their journey right now of tackling this problem you want to solve for them in a different way. And if you look at the later stage research where you're actually testing the prototype, it becomes also just as important because you're going to invite people in, they're going to be in different mood or mindset right now, and you're starting off by telling a story, that's what your scenario is, 
they're explaining them, trying to frame it in a way they can understand why they would be motivated to do a task, what their setting is, what their maybe emotions or their surrounding is, and then to set them up correctly for the story they're going to live through with their product. For presenting your findings, it's the same as for every presentation. Look at your audience, try to figure out what's interesting to them and what engages them, and then try to make a story out of it. Any more questions? Okay, so we'll have a short break, five minutes, and then we'll meet here. One second. Here's the option you can talk. This new record prize with us, it's cash license for one year. We're giving away three of them. It's Windows computer, so if you want to do that, it's us. <laughs> 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 See you in five minutes. <laughs>